Hi, I'm Alma Dimitropoulos, Managing Director and Manager of the New Jersey Market for the J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Welcome to J.P. Morgan's 2022 Summer Reading List Series. We are so thrilled to be joined today by Maggie Doyne, American philanthropist from Mendham, New Jersey, who after graduating high school, took a gap year traveling in Nepal, moved by the poverty and suffering she witnessed as a result of the recent civil war, Maggie decided to stay in Nepal to help children, particularly those orphaned by warfare. Dedicating the last 17 years of her life to helping the community, Maggie went on to found a children's home, a women's center, and a school in Coppola Valley, and went on to co-found Blink Now, a nonprofit focused on serving the children in Nepal. Maggie's here to talk with us about her recently published memoir, Between the Mountain and the Sky, a mother's story of love, loss, healing, and hope, which is featured on J.P. Morgan's 2022 summer reading list. Maggie, welcome. Thank you for having me. We're so excited to learn more about your new book and inspiring work in Nepal. So let's jump right in. Before heading off to college, you took a gap year to travel, and that changed the course of your entire life. What inspired you to stay in Nepal and work with the community there? Well, I definitely wasn't planning on it at all. <laughs> and I initially just went to Nepal with my really good friend. She wanted to know where she came from. She'd been a refugee living in India and wanted to go back and kind of trace her steps back to her village. She was looking for her identity and her sense of home. And it was on that trip that we both started to meet and hear the stories of orphan children. There was one million orphan children in the country of Nepal following a civil war. And it was just locking eyes with children who were just like me, um, only younger and born in a different place in a different time. But the moment came at the dry riverbed and I was walking across and just looked up and saw dozens and dozens of children breaking rocks. And at first I was like, what are they doing breaking rocks? You could just hear the clanging of the <clears throat> metal hitting, hitting this rock and turning it into gravel. And I found out that these children as young as three and four and five years old were breaking the rock to sell a huge bag for the end of the day for about a dollar. And there was something about that just experience that left me feeling sad and shell-shocked and just like, what has happened to our humanity and our human family that we're allowing this and accepting this? And then it kind of turned into, is there anything that I can do? And in that moment, a little girl put her hands together and she said, Namaste Didi, which means hello, big sister. And the first sort of wheels in my head that started turning were, well, I can't do anything for a million children um, or 152 million orphan children in our world, but maybe I could do something for Hima, this one little girl who called me sister. And that was the initial journey, trying to put kids into school and change the reality on that riverbed. Wow, wow, <laughs> wow. So how do you think your upbringing impacted your desire to commit your life to volunteer services? Well, so I grew up with everything in the world. I mean, a simple childhood, suburban New Jersey, but I had a trampoline in my backyard on a cul-de-sac with a dog, two sisters, a mom and a dad. I went to New Jersey public schools, played soccer, had a ponytail. Like, there was nothing specific about my childhood or my upbringing that ingrained this sense of like, oh my gosh, I have to go do something. It was just very, I, I grew up with a lot of love. I grew up with my basic human needs and rights being met. I grew up with um, family and safety. And so it was kind of seeing the flip side of reality mm -hmm. on this polar opposite side of the world that shook me a bit. 
And I, I don't know, in that time, you grew up thinking that everybody had a safe childhood. You know, people tell you about hunger and they tell you about the suffering, but there was something about seeing it face to face mm -hmm. and looking into another human being's eyes, another girl, that I just saw a piece of myself and that connection and that that shared experience of being a girl. And I think um, just having a life of safety and love made me reflect and think like, how can I use that privilege that I was given, that sense of safety, that sense of education, right. opportunity, how right. do I leverage that and create that for someone else? Wow, wow. You used all your saved babysitting money <laughs> to purchase <laughs> land to build an orphanage. Can you tell us more about buying land in Coppola Valley and the early days of starting your amazing project? Yeah, I was so young. And I think part of that youth came with like, we can do this, we can do better. And the beauty of ignorance of youth, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is great. Right, right. It was enough youth that I was so like, you know, you have that fire in your belly and that passion and that energy. And enough youth that I also knew that I needed, you know, other people and mentors right. and a learning mentality. So I started with my babysitting money. And I had exactly $5,000 saved up from the time I was, I don't know, like 11, mother's right. helping. Right. And wow. the land was $5,000. And it was my very first investment, the best thing we ever did. And it was to get to um, the sense of a home. You know, we realized that enrolling kids into school was, was one piece of it. But if your needs of safety and family and a home and clean water to drink and nourishment aren't being met, education is kind of that next right. step up on the hierarchy of needs. So we started with this little patch of dirt, right. <laughs> this right. little piece of land. And the word orphanage, like when you think of it, what comes to mind? It's, they can be dark, dismal, um, sad. You think about loneliness or being forgotten or just, I don't know, you think of slop food on a plate and to, my co-founder and I, we really wanted to change that and make a sense of home, a sense of family, a sense of joy and laughter and fun. And so we just started with a vision of painting the walls bright yellow and always having music playing and always having yummy food on the stove and kites flying in the sky and games of soccer and marbles and dogs and goats and a garden patch. And that was kind of the initial dream of creating a home and uh, a place of laughter and joy and um, a beautiful childhood. Yeah, uh, a nurturing environment for sure. <laughs> so in reading your memoir, you included many letters to your different children of the 58 that you adopted. <laughs> What was the writing process like and what inspired you to include these personal letters at the beginning of each chapter? Because it really, it touched my heart every single chapter reading them. Oh, thank you. I, I think from a very young age, you know, living in a rural part of Nepal, I fell in love with books and I fell in love with the process of journaling. And, you know, as a mom, the moments just go by so fast and you want to just capture everything and writing just became a tool of um, remembering and and processing mm -hmm. and at some point in the process I started writing little love letters to the kids wanting to think about you know their missing teeth or just something funny that they did or something that I was remembering about them so luckily I had so much material mm -hmm. and just things that I would have totally forgotten right. about, but I didn't because I'd been writing since I was 19. And then that evolved into love letters and kind of integrating them into the story. And um, it was a beautiful process of going back to the beginning and the navigating of the cultures and these different worlds and the coming of age journey of being a young woman. And I'm just really grateful that those late nights when the power was out and we just had a candle that I did write little notes and little memories. So it became a memoir in that sense. And then just finding the process by pulling all those pieces together and framing it into a book and something 
that I could pass on to my children. Right. You also initiated Coppola Valley Women's Center in 2013, the Coppola Valley Health Clinic in 2011, and the Coppola Valley Big Sister Home in 2017. What inspired you to keep expanding and offer so many services to the people of Sirket? So as we were working in the community, this was one of the most food deficit regions of the world, post-war recovery. Right. We had the highest maternal and child mortality rates in the region. And we just started to look at the issues surrounding how a child thrives and grows in community and in their culture. And as you're there and you're kind of seeing the different barriers and obstacles, we started to organically come to these conclusions, which one of them being women are the cornerstone of everything. And how do you get to prevention? How do you get to preventing a child from becoming an orphan in the first place? That really comes down to women and empowering um, mothers and caregivers and building communities from the bottom up. And so that led us to creating an empowerment and training center where we instill vocational skills mm -hmm. and business training 101, give access to micro loans, um, empowerment workshops. And we started to build a curriculum around addressing women. It's, it's kind of like what I was talking about before too, about that hierarchy of needs. Well, if a child is coming to school, but they don't have their immunizations or they're drinking dirty water or right. you know, a 25 cent parasite pill can save a child's life. So it's about integrating health, nutrition, um, mental health and the environment and um, yeah, the, the Big Sisters Home was created because we were hitting a barrier for girls at the age of 14, 15, 16 when they become more at risk for trafficking or early marriage, the issues surrounding menstruation. Mm -hmm. So as we were solving these problems in the community, we'd organically, step by step, slowly create programs to enhance and address the issues that the community was facing. And that is how they all integrate and work together and help build and change the community slowly over time. We often hear it takes a village. Um, what do you look for in the people when you're building your team of volunteers? Oh, we, um, number one, just love of children, mm -hmm. belief that they are the answer, that they are the future, that they are our greatest natural resource. Um, community leaders and leadership, passion for mission, um, special skills. We really build our programs with teachers, with social workers, with curriculum developers, with women's empowerment leaders and entrepreneurial training. So just people of different skills, um, a lot of local Nepalese, we realized early on that it had to be for the people and by the people and there had to be that ownership and Nepali people know the answers to the problems and they know the solutions. And so really bringing them into the fold as well and making sure that our, our team and our board was truly Nepali led. And um, yeah, just belief in, in what we do, belief that it's possible and then just hard work and getting at it every single day. Yeah. You know, in, in the book, I was reading how you speak about the pandemic and the subsequent school closings and how it set you and the team back. How did your team and you navigate these challenges? Oh my goodness. Well, I think the pandemic as a world, we're looking at a major backslide when it comes to supporting the vulnerable, the poor, the migrant, the right. refugee. Those were the people who were just so greatly and vastly affected. In Nepal, a lot of times you're living as a daily wage laborer. So you get your a dollar, two dollars a day, and that's how you live and survive. And um, it was between growing seasons when the pandemic hit. So we had to really look at making sure, one, that we could get migrants back home to Nepal safely and making sure that the virus didn't hit rural Himalayan villages. We had to look at food and addressing um, how to continue to run our programs. A lot of the world could make that pivot to Zoom classroom or leveraging technology, but in lesser developed countries, 
you don't have power in homes, you don't have internet connections, you definitely don't have devices. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the conversation amongst equality and in, in the educational space has been about the digital divide and how for most of the world, this has been a two to three year setback, especially for our children. We've had 300 million children out of school for about two years. And that is gonna create a major global disruption that we'll have to come together to address. And school is the safe haven for children. So when those schools shut down, there was a lot of loss, a lot of loss. And we're gonna have to really pull ourselves together and pull ourselves up to navigate as a human family and, and come through this. Agreed, completely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. What do you hope people will take away from reading mm. your story? What, what, what comes to mind? Yeah, number one, I don't think you have to go 8,000 miles away <laughs> to make a difference or make an impact. I think the world will change when all of us come together, doing our part, doing our pieces, building our communities, leading with love, leading with kindness leading with a vision for the future that really looks to our children mm -hmm. and what's in their best interest. I think the world will change when we find a way to make sure that our children are safe and loved and educated. Um, and I believe that education is the greatest equalizer and the greatest opportunity to create a more loving, just and peaceful planet. So I hope people read it and just feel inspired and realize that the power to change the world lies within each of us. Yeah, yeah. So do you have any messages for those who wish to go out and make a difference in the mm. world, whether it be Nepal or other places that are afflicted by poverty and suffering? Mm. A mentor of mine who I've known through the gap year journey, she's always says, Abby is her name, Start with what breaks your heart. Um, and I think that's really good advice. We all have those things that we see that break our hearts. And you know, mine was the riverbed. I, I dreamed of a day when I could walk across that dry riverbed and not see a single child breaking rocks. And today, that's the reality. We don't see children breaking rocks. And I think you start with that first step of wanting to see a change in the world, believing that it's possible and finding your passion, your commitment, that piece of something that you can do. And it doesn't always have to be big or life-changing. It's about the little things and the little um, parts and pieces. Blink Now was built on radical generosity, philanthropy, giving back, love. So I think just grounding ourselves in that, in that love and action, wherever we are, however we choose to show up and getting in there. You can serve on a board. You can right. get involved in your local food pantry. You can volunteer at your kid's school. There's so many ways. And unfortunately, in this time that we're living in, there's so much need. Mm -hmm. There are endless ways to get involved and, and find ways to make the world better. Obviously, Between the Mountain and the Sky is on J.P. Morgan's list of books to read this summer. Yay! Yay. Thank you. So I have to ask, what's on your summer read, must-read list? Oh, I am reading a book right now. It's called uh, You Should Really Talk to Someone, oh. I think. Yeah. No, it's Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Okay. And it's about mental health. It's about, um, and I know that this is Mental Health Month, and it's about a therapist um, who needs a therapist. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so I'm reading that. Um, I'm reading a lot of, gosh, just lighter books right now. I feel like this year I dug into a lot of really deep, uh, my own story was very emotional and, mm -hmm. and full of grief. So I'm looking at a lot of really light books and <laughs> A lot of joy, a lot of hope. <laughs> yeah. Maggie, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, thank you. Thank you for choosing my book. And thank you all for watching our J.P. Morgan 2022 Summer Reading List series. We hope you will join us again for another insightful interview on one of our other featured books. 